Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Coffee and Football, presented by Rick Bobro and Austin Underground, a very special uh, Coffee and Football. I'm your host, Blake Monroe, where I'm joined by Bobby Burton and C.J. Vogel. Guys, before we begin, be sure to tell us where you're checking in from. Obviously, we love to see that, love to see where you're watching from, so be active in the chat. And uh, Bobby, before we begin, I think I'm going to go ahead and bring in a special guest, if that's okay with you. I think it, I don't think he's a guest. <laughs> no. I I'm he's a guest, so. Here we go. Look at this. Look at this guy. <laughs> he's back. <laughs> yeah. Manscaped. We're all back. Lawnmower Ultra. Let's do this. <laughs> Uh, Jerry, welcome back, buddy. Uh, been yeah. a long time. Uh, we can officially announce your rejoining of uh, on Texas football. Appreciate you very much uh, for joining us and rejoining the team here. Uh, you know, I've got a lot of questions for you that we haven't really heard from you in a couple months. Uh, I want to ask you about the recruiting class. I mean, you never really had a voice in that. I uh, want to go over that. I want to ask you about what Sark's doing right now in the SEC eventually. I uh, want to get into a lot of those things. Let's start, though, guys, uh, all of us uh, here with uh, what I'm, I'm concerned about right now, and that's the NCAA versus the University of Tennessee. I mean, it has been crazy in the last uh, 48, 72 hours. First of all, uh, the NCAA didn't even announce it. It was leaked that there's an investigation going on at Tennessee, Florida, and Florida State uh, for uh, illegal uh, or improprieties alleged. Uh, in NCA or in NIL recruiting, okay. Then it's the president of the University of Tennessee writes a clearly scathing rebuttal uh, to the NCAA, and then yesterday, the states of Tennessee and Virginia create and their attorney generals file suit against the NCAA. The the kicker here is that the state of Tennessee didn't go and fight. Um, for the University of Tennessee. Instead, they fought for the players. And all those, so the NCAA is getting it from both sides. The athletes themselves in the state of Tennessee and the university, I think this is going to be, uh, I don't know if it's the, the straw that broke the camel's back, but it's clear the constituency at the highest level of uh, college football not happy with the NCAA right now. Jerry? Welcome back, brother. What do you think about this Tennessee uh, Tennessee stuff right now? Yeah, you know, I, I'm not sure I have a – Bobby, you have a stronger opinion on that than I do. I've, I've just been more into the recruiting portion where Sark is and all these guys. Um, look, I just – I think it's just going to be so interesting to see where this goes in the next two or three years, right? Um, I've always felt like this would end up with, um, you know, these the, the football players, college athletes ended up being – employees of the state where they go to college. And I think that's where all this ends up heading one day. I don't know how soon it's going to get there. Um, I, I do, I, you know, I think it's interesting that the way Tennessee responded to the NCA, and I think that's the way a lot of people are responding to the NCA, but I'm not sure I have a super strong opinion on how this is going to play out. You probably do more than I. Yeah, I, I, I don't. CJ, your, your, your thoughts on whether or not Tennessee is just leading the gang here or I, I'm worried about it, basically. I, I, I think that in the reason I'm worried, and worried is not the right word, but I, I just foresee a situation where the NCAA implodes. I, that's that's my take right now. It, it feels like to me every time that you see another one of these, you know, uh, bring ups of litigation to the NCAA, it's just another, you know, small domino on the way to, you know, eventual, I don't want to say collapse, but a, a movement towards not using the NCAA anymore. Whatever that might be, it just feels like over time, if you continue bringing up, you know, one, the issue with NIL and two, uh, the carry out of how these lawsuits go down, it just feels like over time it's going to build up to a point where it bursts. I, I've got to say this. I mean, if if look, if institutions like Sports Illustrated can go the way of the dodo bird, so can the NCAA. I'll put it that way. I mean, right now they've got five different litigations going on. The House versus the NCAA, Johnson versus the NCAA, the National Labor Relations Trial and the Pac-12 Conference in the NCAA, the Department of Justice and the states versus the NCAA transfer rule, Tennessee and Virginia AGs versus the NCAA, 
I mean, they're getting it from all angles. They're going to have more lawyers than they will actually have administrators. I mean, at what point do you say uncle and give up? Yeah. Gary, let's get back to you. <laughs> let's get back to you, bud. What, so last couple of months you've been working for On3 National. Um, and, you know, this has been a situation where we haven't had a chance to really talk to you about Texas recruiting. Let's start right there, uh, right now. Texas recruiting, what do you think of Sark and all of what he's doing across the SEC, the hire of Johnny Nansen, all of that stuff right now? Yeah, I think I'll start with the hires. Um, I think Johnny Nansen, it, he's been out in California this week, right? I mean, that is going to keep help Sark keep that recruiting footprint in California he wants with Coach Choke moving on in Nevada, obviously. I think that hire – uh, serves that purpose, a gr tremendous coach, obviously. But from a recruiting geography standpoint and where Sark wants to be with this Texas program, Arizona, California are always going to be very important to Steve Sarkeesian. Now he's got Johnny Nansen, who is a D.C. at Arizona. Obviously, he went to see a linebacker yesterday at Narbonne that had an Arizona offer from Nansen in January of 2023. So he's going to recruit out in California um, you're going to see that more and more with him, and that keeps that footprint. I love the D-line hire. Um, you know, look, I think Bo Davis is a tremendous coach. Uh, by the way, I think he's awesome. Um, I, I, I think I think Kenny was a tremendous hire. I, there's a couple of people I trust in this business that train defensive linemen for the NFL draft, worked the Von Miller Pass Rush Academy. You all know Nathan O'Neill. He's been on this show before. He trains a bunch. He had Will Anderson. Um, and, and Jalen Carter, Keandre Coburn last year before for the last draft, he's got Sweat, Byron Murphy, a lot of guys again this year. He said a home run hire, phenomenal hire. He said he comes from that Pete Jenkins run game coaching tree, but he said he's an exceptional pass rushing coach. Um, so you put those things together, a guy from the state of Georgia, see that keeps that SEC tie at defensive line coach, well, I think it's imperative. I think you have to have it moving to the SEC. Uh, I thought it was great that Jeff Banks offered Myron Charles out of Port Charlotte yesterday, big-time player, um, big-time defensive lineman out of Florida. You saw Sark was already by Melbourne O'Galley to see Brandon Brown earlier this week. Obviously, uh, Texas was getting the, the compliance paperwork done, so Coach uh, couldn't be out there. Defensive line coach couldn't be out there. But I think those hires covered the bases in recruiting geography what, with what Steve Sarkeesian wants at Texas, the way he's been recruiting at Texas, and the way he's built out this roster. On the 24 class, I'll be brief. It's going to finish with, what, the number five, six, seven ranked class in the country, anywhere in there, depending on how the, all the final rankings shake out. But, you know, you put three top six classes uh, together in a row. You're on the right track, no doubt about it. Um, and I think this 25 class is going to be another one. I'll, I'll sit here and predict that this will be a fourth straight top 10 class, and possibly a fourth straight top six class. Um, I think they're in on the right guys. I think it's been very interesting to follow where Steve Sarkeesian's been on the road here the last couple of weeks. That's telling, right? I mean, where does he go and show face to kids? Because you can now sit down and visit with those kids for about 15, 20, 30 minutes. Look, we're not doing in-home visits, right? I mean, as some people are. I've seen guys at basketball games uh, recently with a family for the whole two and a half hours. But you can go to these schools and now you can visit. Parents are actually coming to the high schools to make these visits with the head coaches and, or coaches when they stop by schools. So, for instance, a Kelshawn Johnson at Hitchcock, when Sark goes to see him, well, Kelshawn's a parent's there listening to that conversation, a part of that conversation. So that's one little small change in recruiting that's major. So really following where the head coaches go uh, is, is pretty telling signs early on about some top targets in the 25 class. You mentioned the guys going and where Sark was. Where was he yesterday, to your knowledge, Jerry? Well, he was. Uh, they went to Louisville. Uh, saw Michael Fasusi, five-star offensive tackle. I think it was him, Flood, and maybe Tashar Choice were there. Obviously, Fasusi did not come to the January 20 junior day. Um, he went to Missouri uh, in stu instead. And I mean, who doesn't want to meet Eli Drinkwitz? I mean, I'm in for that too. Uh, but uh, <laughs> look, and then and then he went out to Oregon. Uh, but the, he'll officially visit Texas in June. I, Texas, Oklahoma, a and going to be in this one, right? I mean, uh, CJ, I can't wait for CJ and I start really talking about 
some of this Texas versus A&M with this move to the SEC. CJ and I are going to have some fun with this now uh, because Texas and Texas A&M are going to go head to head on more guys. Uh, but then Sark went to uh, Garland Saxey to see Kalik Lockett, four-star wide receiver, really good playmaker up there. Obviously, the home of Devin DuVernay, who we've had on the show before and had in the Under Armour All-America game. Uh, Sark went to see Riley Pettijan. Him and Ryan Day were both at McKinney High yesterday to see Riley Pettijan, the four-star linebacker, their former teammate of Xavier Filsamy, who, by the way, is off to a really fast start in Austin. I'll throw that one out there. He's impressing early on, as I he should. I told people that, too, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that he's – you know, I, I have a joke, but we'll save that for a manscape ad with this. <laughs> but um, look, uh, Sark. So Sark is in DFW yesterday. He was with KJ Lacey um, on Tuesday afternoon. I thought that was key, right? He had had that scheduled for a week or two when he was going to go see Ryan Williams coming off the official visit to Texas. Obviously, Ryan Williams shut it down, broke Auburn's hearts, and committed back to Alabama, um, and then never make that trip to Austin. But Sark. Went in Mill. We were in Sarah Land Tuesday to see KJ Lacey, his father, mother. Everybody was at that. Uh, like I talked about earlier, he went to see Brandon Brown. I mentioned that he went to Calhoun, Georgia to see Amari Winston as well, the tight end commit. Uh, he was a tremendous playmaker, all four star guys. So they're on the right guys. They're continuing to evaluate. Like you see Nansen going to take a look at the linebacker, which I won't even pronounce his name right at Narbonne yesterday. So there's continuing to evaluate this 2025 class, but you're starting to see some of these real top targets emerge with where Sarkeesian's been in the last couple of weeks. Kalik Lockett's an interesting one to me because he hadn't been a uh, top of the, uh, the name that was on the tip of our tongue uh, for a long time. And, and it's, this is, a, I must admit, it was Kalik Lockett. This is Seth bringing in. But tell us a little bit more about Kalik Lockett, because frankly, Jerry, that's not a guy CJ and I had spent a, long, a lot of time talking about on the recruiting breakdown. Yeah, he's a guy that Texas invited to January 20 junior day. He did not attend. He was at a, he went to A&M. He's been to a couple others. Um, but uh, he's a guy that Texas likes. I mean, they obviously like him. Sark went to see him. Uh, but he's a guy who I think maybe isn't as publicized for some reason as some other receivers in this class, but he is a tremendous talent, a top 100, 150 type kid in the country. Uh, he's continued to kind of mature. His body's mature and he's retained his quickness and speed. Uh, but he's a guy Texas likes quite a bit, um, but he just did not attend that junior day. One of the things that's interesting was, um, and I know we'll get into it, is the next time I think you're going to see Texas get a lot of these kids on, and I'm not going to say guys won't be sprinkled in at times, is spring practices. I talked to Floyd Guidry uh, at spring yesterday, the defensive lineman, um, and they're going to, they're trying, they're talking to him about getting him back for a spring football visit, uh, to watch spring practice. Same thing with Chase Sims, a defensive tackle out of Richmond Randall. So, uh, I, you're going to start to see Texas try to get some of those guys if they didn't get them on campus in January in for a spring pr football practice. Uh, CJ Vogel, uh, this is a, a guy that uh, you have never been on video with before, Jerry <laughs> Hamilton, but now you're getting to witness some greatness here. Uh, the, CJ, you and Jerry will be doing the recruiting breakdown from now on every Tuesday on, on, on Texas football. You and uh, Jerry are going to be doing a lot of videos together. Uh, Blake and I will be doing uh, coffee and football with Jerry going forward. CJ is going to have a, another regular spot that we're going to talk about a little bit more later. We're not uh, we're not uh, we're not going to we're not going to divulge all the secrets quite yet. But uh, Jerry, just uh, got to say this, dude. Welcome back. Uh, you and I have been friends for so long. Uh, very happy that you're back with us and uh, working with us, et cetera. CJ, you're in for a real treat, buddy. Look, I don't care about you and Blake. I came to work with CJ, so let's get it. <laughs> I feel like I'm watching a master at work this morning. <laughs> Man, my my mouth is like pretty much worn out at the point. I'm still not done bringing all the comments up on the screen. I feel like, I feel like Blake's added like 100 new baseball cards back there or something. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Blake wanted to scratch yeah, off. I need to do an ad read real quick, guys. Uh, since 2004, Austin Underground has specialized in difficult underground com commercial installations. The team's engineering background gives Austin Underground the ability to perform work other firms often consider just too risky. Rick Vavro and his team offer an end to end client experience, including seamless communication, budgeting, staffing, and top notch trade partners. And most importantly, they produce solid quality work each and every time. Uh, that's Austin Underground, Rick Vavro and his team, uh, A1 top class guys. Give them a shout if you need any underground commercial installations. Thanks, Rick. 
All right, guys. Well, we got plenty more to talk about. Obviously, we're going to get to all of y'all's questions or at least as many as we can. We got lots of recruiting to talk about. But first, I want to bring in our other special guest today, and that is uh, Texas softball head coach Mike White. And Coach White, how are you doing this morning? Oh, great. Thank you. Good morning. Hook him, Coach. Uh, hook him. Uh, I, I, I got to say, I like the uh, I like the background you've got there. He's got some funky little uh, twirly things in the background. What are those? Yeah, that's stuff from New Zealand. So, so the one that's on my left is the uh, coro, and um, you know it's a sign of unity. So that, that's pretty cool. And um, a couple other ones I've got on the shelf up there as well. So that's where I was born. So I, I like to kind of follow the traditions of the Maori. <laughs> Well, Coach guys, White, obviously a big season coming up. You, you guys start, well, next weekend, actually, February the 9th at the Stacey Winsberg Tournament. And right off the bat, I mean, you guys are going to face some some big competition. UCLA, who's a top 10 team. Can you give us an outlook on your team this year and what you, some of the strengths are? Yeah, well, obviously, we're coming off a good year with, um, you know, our freshman class from last year. That was the big talk of uh, everything was, you know, including the redshirt freshman Maloney. So, you know, they're going to be the mainstays. Most of them are looking good so far this year, coming back. But we feel like we've added to that um, with a really good freshman class, including Katie Stewart, uh, Ryan Brown, um, uh, Tegan Cavan, the pitcher, six-footer from Iowa, uh, Caden Henry, uh, um, Adea Wallace, and um, Victoria Hunter. And they're all looking pretty good. So it's, it's quite a competition. We feel like we've got a deeper squad, and they're going to push each other for playing time. Yeah, Coach, Coach, thank you for joining us this morning. I, I wanted to ask you about the guys that you have coming back from last, last year's squad. It feels like, you know, that will be – experience will be one of the strengths of this team from what we saw a year ago. How important is that to you and, you know, early on in the season, you know, getting off to the right start with, uh, you know, people that have been there before? Yeah, well, definitely looking at our schedule, I think we have one of the toughest schedules in the country and um, we're going to be up against the wall and, and things may not go our way straight away and – we understand that and we're hoping that with the experience, you know, um, that we've made uh, Alyssa Washington our captain. It's the first time we've had an actual captain, you know, with a C on her chest. Um, so that's going to be exciting to have her out in the uh, middle infield there. She'll be on the field somewhere. And so I think she's going to give that calming effect of having been there and done it. Bella Dayton's another one, you know, fifth year senior uh, with a lot of experience. Um, Estelle Check, uh, you know, a left hand pitcher with transfer we brought in. Um, you know, she's in her third season with us. So we've got some experience here that's going to help. And I think that's what uh, showed last year in the, in the um, super, super Regional against Tennessee where, you know, they we just didn't quite have that calming effect when things got tough for us. So we're hoping that's going to change a little bit this year with the experience we have. You mentioned Tennessee, Coach, uh, and I want to take that a step further. Not this year, but next year you head to the SEC with Oklahoma. Does that make, uh, you know, the Pac-12 had been one of the best softball conferences for decades. Then it kind of moved around. Is the SEC with you, your addition in Oklahoma is going to be the best uh, best softball conference in the country? Uh, I think without a doubt. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, you're going to have, you know, 14, 15 teams that can possibly make the postseason. And uh, that's going to be interesting when you come into Super Regionals because you're going to have those crossover matches, you know, if the SEC teams make it through. And, you know, <laughs> it's, it's never a lot of fun playing a conference opponent, especially when there's a trip to the World Series on the line. But, you know, that is one year, one more year away. Um, you know, we're excited for that transition. But uh, this year, you know, the Big 12 is going to be pretty tough. Uh, you know, we added BYU, UCF, and Houston into the mix. Um, so that's going to be an interesting. And, uh, adding a little more travel. And, of course, you know, that cuts down our, our preseason tournament schedule by two weeks uh, as well. Coach, inside the circle, you're returning a lot from last year, as you mentioned earlier. What's the next step to see, you know, Estelle, Mack, and Siddeley really start going and, and, and catch that next groove of uh, dominance inside the circle? Well, I think, you know, when you look at it, we have five uh, excellent pitches that are all a little bit different. But what let us down was their control and the big moment and the big pitch. Um, you know, we, we found the middle of the zone too much and we've got to be more stingy, so to speak, uh, in those situations. I think our defense looks a little bit better this year as well. Um, you know, we, our fielding percentage hasn't been the best if you look at the top 10 teams. Uh, so we're working hard to kind of alleviate that and look better on the defensive side of it. But the pitching, uh, we've got to be more consistent. Um, you know, I, I like what uh, Sophia Simpson's doing this year so far in the last month. She's looking really good, and we're excited about that because she's she's difficult. You know, she's kind of like that knuckleballer, so to speak, and she's 
kind of, you, you could think you got it, but it, all of a sudden it disappears on you with, the, with her change up. Um, so that's good to have. And, and the freshman, like I said, Tegan Kavan, um, adds a little bit of high velocity up in the zone for us. Hey, Coach White, I wanted to ask you something more about you, your playing days. Because, look, when anybody that goes to your Wikipedia page, they see a bunch of gold and silver medals, right? I mean, <laughs> you're apparently – look, I, I – I didn't grow up as a fast pitch softball guy on the men on the men's side, but you're apparently one of the best pitchers uh, of all time in men's fast pitch softball. Growing up in New Zealand, where was it soccer and, and fast pitch softball? Were those the two big sports for you growing up and just kind of your background for Texas fans that may not know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, those are the two sports that I gravitated towards, but uh, you know, I went to school to major in sports, you know, <laughs> which, you know, that's kind of what I did in high school. And, and uh, New Zealanders are, uh, you know, they're not too much for fans. They like to get involved and try everything. So I tried everything in, in school and tried a little bit of cricket, if you're not familiar with that, but didn't just didn't really like that game. So I, I stayed away from that one. Uh, my parents came from a softball background, so that's what I kind of gravitated towards. But at that age, my first love was um, was soccer. Uh, you know, which is kind of weird because New Zealand's known for rugby. I um, mean, it's a fanatical country on, on that, and they're really good at it. But uh, I gravitated towards soccer and was selected to play for a New Zealand B national team. But uh, for some reason, uh, something didn't didn't happen there, and I made a trip to the United States as a semi-pro and did that for 30 years and was very successful. Was able to win, um, you know, a couple of gold medals for my co- native country and a couple of a bronze medal for the USA when I become a, uh, a citizen in 95. Wow. That's crazy. That's awesome. Well, Coach White, one of the other things, I mean, you guys, y'all are ranked number five uh, going into the preseason, but y- y'all play an extremely, extremely tough schedule. You actually face the preseason number one through four, I think along with like four or five other top 25 teams. And in the first two weeks alone, uh, y'all face number two, three, eight, 20, and 25. And I asked Coach Pierce this last week, but how important is it for y'all to play those tough teams early to get ready for conference play? Yeah, th- th- ask me that in another month. So <laughs> 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 see if I was crazy or not, but you know, we, we need to test ourselves. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, it, it could it could be a double edged sword. Obviously, if you don't, you know, RPIs are good. I mean, the strength of schedule is fantastic, but you know, unless you win the games, it doesn't mean a whole lot. So we know that. But we want to battle test our kids. Um, as I said, we still got a pretty young team. If you look at it, sophomores. There'll be four or five playing, and we got uh, two or three in the, in the freshmen. So over half the team is kind of still underclassmen. So we need to kind of test them. Um, you know, I've always said before, you can't practice being in front of you know, 8,000 fans, you know, until it's time. And so we're going to bring some of the experience back into the program. We're going to be tested. We know that. Um, it, but it's going to be how we react to it. You know, whether it goes really well or not, we've got to understand that this is all for a reason to be better at the end. Coach, I, I got to ask you, I, I thank you for joining us, by the way. Really appreciate you. Um, I, you know, fans, uh, you've won everywhere you've went. And you just talked about being battle tested. Um, I'd like to know your overall philosophy on soft, on coaching softball, on melding a team together, that sort of stuff. Where, why have you always been a winner is, is my question as a coach. Uh, score one more run than the other team. So you know, <laughs> it's, it's either that or throw a shutout. I've never lost a shutout, so that's one of my, my good sayings here. But but I, I don't know. I mean, I just um, I feel like I was always competitive as a player. I loved the game. Uh, I always competed to win. Um, I'm ultra competitive, actually. If you ask anybody that knows me, um, you know, I, I love I love the challenge of the game itself. It's dynamic. It's always changing. And you got to change with the times. And, um, you know, that's one thing about coaching college sports is you can change your team, a quarter of your team every year. And uh, so being able to do that, and, and that's one thing I'm proud of. You know, I haven't won a national championship or anything like that. But uh, I'm proud that our teams have always been, you know, in that top, you know, 10, 15 in the country. And um, that's exciting. And, and it's good because you see a lot of kids, um, you know, watching our team from – two years ago, go to the World Series and see a kid like Janae Jefferson, uh, you know, Mary Iacopo get back, uh, Shannon Rhodes and a, and a few others that are still on the program this year, Alyssa Washington. Uh, and just seeing them, you know, th- their dreams come to fruition from being in that stage and, and attaining those goals, those, those are big. Um, and I, I really like that. And so my challenge is, and I can tell this to kids, I can't promise them national championships, but I can promise them they'll be better. And I think that um, from my experience from the playing field, 
the experience from I have on the coaching staff with the uh, associate head coach, Coach Singleton, you know, his experience from the minor leagues, being an infielder and also being a good hitter, that's great. And then uh, Coach Zaleski, you know, her experience from the pro league, she's one of the top hitters in that. Um, and also, uh, you know, from a coach, you know, her experience, she's able to kind of show them, not only tell them, but show them. And uh, that's great. I always like that. And Coach uh, Patty Ruth Taylor now, who's coming as a pitching coach to help us out. Um, you know, her experience as a pitcher, then also as a coach uh, at Lehigh um, is, is, is great. And it gives him more time. And that's what we're excited about, adding that fourth coach, because now it allows us for me to be more of a general manager and overlook every facet of the game and trust more time to the pitchers with, with Coach PR. Because uh, we have five pitches, and uh, it's hard for one person to look after to five. Hey, Coach, I have one more thing, uh, just based on some of the comments you made. You've been to, I believe, six World Series uh, in the last 11 years. Uh, maybe I'm off by one. Um, but what's been different from you from the first one to the last one? How much have you changed? Is it stylistically? Is it What have you learned about yourself? that you've changed maybe as you've continued to evolve as a coach? You know, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, you always try to change. I think you've got to be dynamic. And I remember Coach Candrea, who was, uh, you know, USA team national coach and uh, Hall of Famer. I remember him saying that uh, I get, he got asked a question from somebody in the audience that said, you know, you know, you told us this two years ago and now you're telling us this. And he said, well, if I'm the same coach I am in two more years, then shoot me. You know, so <laughs> – um, I think that's it. You got to keep changing. You know, the, the the kids you're bringing in are changing their backgrounds, the pressures. You know, the social media, the NIL. I mean, it's just like a revolving stage kind of thing. And so I, I'm I'm trying to change and adapt and get to know more. I'm I'm a lifelong learner. Um, I always think there's a better way to do things, and, um, and that's that's the challenge for us as coaches is to keep changing and doing things a little bit different. If you ask my Oregon players, it came down. Uh, a couple of years ago, they said I got softer. So, <laughs> but, you know, some of that might be by design, by the rules, by the way. But, um, you know, because you know, we can't run them anymore, so to speak. And some of the things we used to do when we first got in. But, um, you know, I, I am uh, I do try to evolve with the times and, and become a, a better coach than I was. Well, Coach White, thank you so much for joining us. We definitely appreciate your time and best of luck this upcoming season. I know the Longhorn fans will definitely be behind you and this team. And you guys start next Friday, February the 9th at the Stacey Winsberg Tournament. And best of luck there. Yeah, I don't know if we're going to need a boat out there or not. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say, if you need anybody to carry bags for you, I'm, up, I'm always up for a trip to a beach in Florida. So you <laughs> Bobby and Blake have my information just so if you need me help. For sure, guys. Well, I thank you all for – and it's a great time to be a Longhorn right now. There's so much success going on with the programs and the teams. And, you know, CDC is uh, obviously our, our fearless leader. And, uh, you know, kudos to him. So, anyway, guys, hook up. Coach, hook up. Thanks for joining us, man. Thanks, thank coach. you, Coach. A lot of fun. Good sense of humor, man. Wow. <laughs> what a sense of humor. Yeah, definitely. Good, great guess, for sure. And always good to get insight on those programs that we don't get to talk about too in-depth as well. So, well, guys, we have – so many super chats that that we need to knock out. Uh, a lot of them just comments. And so I want to knock out some of those right now. Texas Beats, thank you for the super chat. He says, free Jerry Hamilton. And then Christian Kruger, or Kruger says, happy UIL realignment day. New Braunfels back to 5A. Yep, 17 minutes. We should uh, know where all the schools are going district-wise. I, I, had to make, I had to make my return on realignment day. <laughs> hey, Jay, Blake, tell people exactly what that is for people that are just Longhorn fans and don't understand realignment day. They're not yeah. going to be many, but. Yeah, so so from class 1A to 6A, obviously all those schools are in a district for, for sports and then academic, certain academic things. Um, and, you know, the UIL, every two years, they look at the numbers. The, the schools turn in their numbers in, what is it, Jerry, November, I believe, yeah. October, November, somewhere in there. Um, and, you know, they start classifying them based on the numbers that they've turned in. Uh, they sit down for the next couple of months, and then on February 1st or around there each year, they go and they start releasing the district pairings, first for football um, and then for your other sports, basketball, baseball, softball, that type of deal. So you could – a lot of times your districts are completely different in football than they are in basketball, especially at the smaller school level, and your divisions go away in those sports as well, whereas in football you have Division One, Division Two in each classification. 
in basketball, baseball, and softball, there's no divisions, just class 3A and your districts that you're in. So and We had somebody asking about the soda. Are they going to go 5A? I have not seen the final decision on that. They're opting up. They're opting up to 6A. They did. I believe so. I believe they decided to opt up is what I was told. Uh, uh, I would have stayed 5A and dished out some butt kickings for two years. You're only going to be there <laughs> two years anyways. <laughs> I guess, but they dished out enough in 6A, but even like, I'm not sure they would lose in any sports for two years on 5A, in 5A level. I mean, that's that would have been unbelievable to watch. No, and, and then there was a couple in 4A that opted up to 5A as well. So, but yeah, 15 minutes, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have all of that information. So, Pooh here says, Jerry, is that really you? Watching from South Korea. Thank you, Pooh, for the super uh, chat. Oh, 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 it's me. I'm back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then William Nish says, what a great morning. Welcome back, Jerry. Got a big smile on my face, as we all do. Honey Badger. Jerry, great to see you. Here's something for your jerky fun. I'm Thank on the road you. next week. I need that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then A to Z Texas Talk. Welcome back, Jerry. Get you some jerky, my man. So you're you're loading up. Right now, now. ready for the road trip. (laughs) And then this final super chat, guys, and it's one that we can actually discuss a little bit. Rich Rich Thompson says the NCAA needs to go away. A new governing body needs to be established. Football should be a separate entity of governance. Y'all's thoughts? I agree. And what's more, I think that that Charlie Baker, the head of the NCAA, might agree. Like, I'm not so sure that there's not some nudging of this uh, got this overreach right now, maybe by the NCAA that is predicated on pushing guys to go ahead and go, not you know circling back to the NCAA and asking the NCAA to st- solve all its problems. But someone needs to step up in the vacuum. If if the NCAA is abdicating that, and the universities themselves don't want to do it, then who's going to do it? You know, we've been talking about a college football czar of some level. Maybe that's where it needs to go. Okay, y'all. Well, let's get to some questions uh, because we we have plenty of those. And Jay, let's start with one for you from Champ Bailey. What did Alabama do to seal the deal with Ryan Williams? Was there real momentum with him and Texas? That's actually a great question. So uh, when I was down at the Under Armour game, uh, well, it's obviously a lot, a lot of you guys know I used to uh, work ESPN and Under Armour as part of that for years. Um, all those guys are great down there. I used to work with still there. Um, my big takeaway from being down there, and I'm sure CJ can echo this, was um, that Ryan Williams wanted to go to Alabama. And he was still leaning to Alabama. Everybody just thought, oh, he's going to go to Auburn. Um but it, what I learned down there was he was still leaning to Alabama right up until Nick Saban retired. And it was going to be a tough pull for anybody uh, if Nick Saban had stayed there. Once he retired, obviously that threw it in. That just threw a chaos into the recruitment, right? And Auburn thought it was a done deal. I started hearing more positive things with Texas than Auburn. I had somebody tell me, and he does, he's not going to Auburn. That's not really where he wants to go. He just feels a lot of pressure. And that turned out to be 100% true, by the way. He didn't even make the visit unless he pops in this weekend, um, which I don't think will happen. So I, I think he was a lean to Alabama the entire way. I think Texas did a great job. They put up a good fight. I thought Auburn got him on campus four times, by the way. Um, K.J. Lacey with him for about two or three of those. Uh, but I think he was lean in Alabama the whole time after those two meetings with Kalen DeBoer. Look, Isaiah Bond goes to Texas. I mean, there's – Look, Ryan needs – I think Ryan needs some time physically. He just reclassified from 25 to 24, and he doesn't get in there till June. But there's one thing the guy's got, and that is real, real speed with a football in his hands. Um, and and you, he's very similar physically to Devontae Smith. But I think Alabama's where he wanted to be. I think Texas and Auburn gave him a lot to think about. But after he felt comfortable with Kalen DeBoer um, in that staff uh, at Alabama, he went right back where his heart was. I wanted to double up on that, Jerry. We talked about Texas sticking around a little bit in that recruitment, despite not having visited Austin. From your side of things, what was it that allowed the Longhorns and Sarkeesian to to stick around as long as they did? The scheme. And so, look, Sark offered him – Ryan has a great story. Um, that I, I, I think if anybody paid attention to when like he was interviewed at the Under Armour game, I think he told the story um, that you know Sark 
saw one play on film and offered him, right? And and is that recruiting? Maybe, but recruiting matters, right? And um, but he is a three clip player, and he may have if it was his best clip, he's a one clip player. That's how good talented he is. Uh, so Sark offered him really early on, uh, and and had stayed in the game with him, right? I mean, Sark stayed in the game with Ryan Wingo to last year in that in the twenty four cycle, despite going through that coaching change at wide receiver. Sark stayed in the game with Ryan Williams, obviously recruiting him and Milwee, talking to KJ Lacey all the time. Lacey had great things to tell Ryan Williams about Austin and the University of Texas. And I know that's where Texas fans are now wondering what's can Alabama flip KJ Lacey. Um, but, you know, I don't I, I don't have anything on that at this point. I think the, the meeting went very well with Texas Tuesday. But I think Sark just personally recruiting Ryan Williams. I think having KJ Lacey committed, uh, seeing the Texas scheme. It was a big thing with Ryan Williams' interest in the Longhorns. And then Randy Johnson wants to know, any reason to say hi, Jerry? <laughs> Just for today, hi. <laughs> hey, Jerry, uh, go back to Portal. We haven't asked you about Portal, uh, guys. I mean, first time we've been able to talk uh, here. Uh, what did you think of what Texas did in the Portal, specifically receiver recruiting and – along with Amari Nyblack at tight end. I love it. I, I love it because Silas Bolden had a punt return. I'm sure CJ's throwing out all the stats, right, at some point. Or you guys – CJ, uh, but Silas Bolden had a punt return for a touchdown last year. Matthew Golden had two kickoff returns for touchdowns last year. I think Texas got not just playmakers at wide out, but playmakers in the return game. And I think the conference you're going into – uh, look, the athletes are going to go up two or three ticks. That doesn't mean every team's better, but the athletes are certainly going up two or three notches. So having threats in the return game is huge. I like that Sark targeted that along with the wide receiver talent. I mean, look, Silas Bolden to me is such an interesting player uh, because he's, you know, what is he, five, eight and a half, right? I mean, if Silas, if you're watching, no, I don't have your official uh, uh, height from an Under Armour camp years ago, but let's say five, eight and a half. Um, but the guy plays like he's 6'2", and he's super quick. He's ex elite quickness, plus-plus quickness, whatever term you want to use. I really think he's going to be surprise people with the playmaking he's going to have. I mean, he's a guy that will leave his feet and fight for a football. I mean, he's not a, just the average slot receiver. The guy, he's got some physicality to him. He plays bigger than whatever his height and weight is. I think Matthew Golden – uh, it can win 50-50 balls. I think it's going to mean a lot to him to play at the University of Texas and kind of prove a point uh, from his recruitment coming out of high school, something to keep an eye on with him. Texas offered late, but I'm not sure they ever went all in, red carpet, recruited him, right? Um, and, and a lot of schools were that way. I think he's got a big point to prove. And I think Isaiah, Bol uh, Isaiah Bond, who I did see in high school, his speed is ridiculous now. I mean, he is a, take a top off the defense vertical threat that even Texas didn't have last year. I mean, Xavier Worthy's tremendous, but it's different, right? You wanted to get the ball in Xavier's hands more and let him work more, and you just wanted to run him vertical. Isaiah Bond is going to scare uh, defensive coordinators, but I think Nye Black is huge. Um, he's going to be, and I'm not going to say he's going to be better than JT Sanders, but I could see him making more chunk plays than even JT did with the team he's coming into uh, and the talent around him. Uh, at quarterback, running back, offensive line, and wide receiver. I think Nye Black's going to have a really big year. All right, Joe, we have some more Super Chats that we need to get to real quick. And uh, Jonathan McKay says, what will the team say is the goal this year? Sark previously said it was the Big 12 championship. Winning the SEC is obviously a much higher bar. Well, I think there's 12 teams at the end of the year that can really tout their season as a success. I would like Texas to – kind of adopt that as their season goal. I think now that it's more in a way more realistic and you're coming off of a year in which you did it in a much more difficult four team playoff. I think that's a good goal to have. You know, you, you play pretty talented teams along the way, the defending national champions, uh, George is on the schedule at home. Obviously Oklahoma's never easy, but then you get some, some new faces and, and revived rivalries. So standing up to those challenges and tasks that you get, whether it be on the road or at home, Finishing in the top 12 and finding a way into that college football playoff is the goal that I have for them, especially with the talent that they've added and the guys that they have coming back at specific positions, quarterback, offensive line. I Hey, CJ, to your point, I literally was writing with someone, texting with someone. I'm one defensive tackle, like big-time def defensive tackle away 
from thinking Texas is going to get back in that category this year. That's really, I, I feel like they've got the quarterback, they've got the depth. One, offensive line looks terrific. Uh, I think they're going to piece it together on the back end and at linebacker. I think they're one big time defensive tackle away from me saying, I think they're a playoff team next year. I still think they got to get that one big time defensive tackle, though. I mean, I'll, I'll say this I'll add to this. I think they're going to be just as good a team, but it doesn't mean you're going to have as much success. I think this team is going to be even more explosive than last year. Um, I love high school portal recruiting. I didn't touch on Andrew Makuba. The combination of that, what that's going to bring to the safety position, Makuba, whether it's safety or nickel, Makuba, um, it, it, obviously Jody Barron's coming back, but with Makuba, and Phil Sami and Jordan Johnson Rebell, who's a very instinctive guy at safety and is always going to be underappreciated because of that. Um, I think they did some really good things at safety. When you look at Derek Williams being a sophomore, Taft coming back with another year of experience, I, I really like where they're headed. I think corner, that depth needs to shore up a little bit this spring with some of those young guys, but I like the guys they brought into the program. All right, y'all. Well, we have a super chat from Juan, and he says, what do y'all think about Kyle Flood being a candidate for the Boston College head coaching job? Your thoughts, please. I mean, look, he, he's from the area. He was a head coach at Rutgers. Um, I, I think he's an awesome guy in, in, in interviews in front of a mic. Um, I think he would win a press conference. I think there's a lot of strengths to, to Kyle Flood outside of being an offensive line coach. A yeah, very, Rod and I, a potentially great offensive line coach. Yeah. yeah, Rod and I were talking about it last night. You know, his, uh, you know, keeping him on staff, I thought was very important. We've talked about the turnover at other positions. Right now, Kyle Flood maintaining a spot on the Steve Sarkeesian staff has allowed Texas to see development each year in the offense of uh, whether it be run game or pass protection. I mean. We were talking about it. The, the growth that we saw from Christian Jones from 2020 against Oklahoma State and some of those games that he had in that campaign to what we're seeing right now at the Senior Bowl has been outstanding. And I think that's all credit due to, to one, Christian Jones' ability to learn and develop, and two, Kyle Flood for getting right where he needs to be technically. So that's been a, a very important piece to what I've seen from the Texas success offensively. Okay, and and I, think, I think an interesting yeah. part with, uh, you know, the, uh, the Kyle Flood conversation is, you know, guys who have been a head coach before, I mean, do you want to go back into it now? I mean, there's there, that's a tough job. Boston College is a tough job. Let's put it that way. There's a reason uh, that uh, Hefley left and went to the NFL. I mean, it's in the, today's landscape of, of college sports and NIL, that is a very difficult job. He actually did a great job up there. I mean, he's leaving the he's leaving a head coaching position in a power five conference. Yes. Or now power four to go yeah. be a defense coordinator in the NFL. That should be very telling. He doesn't think he can win at Boston College. Yeah. Jerry, I wanted to Jerry stick on the, yeah. I wanted to stick on the offensive line. You know, we talked about the recruits from the 24 class. There's three coming in on the offensive line. Uh, very briefly, like wh what did you see from that their tape, you know, their film? You know, you got to see a couple of them in person, obviously. What stood out to you about the, the three coming in? Yeah, so I, I I always start with Daniel Cruz, and it's not because he's the best prospect. I think Brandon Baker has the highest ceiling, but because Daniel Cruz is a center, right? And 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 I, I've always loved Daniel Cruz because I think he has some of the case he stuttered in him. And I've said it for a couple of years on, on the show and elsewhere. He has that physicality. That tough because he smiles all the time until he knocks you down. Then he'll smile when he picks you up, right? But, um, but he's also he picked up on the he's such a fast learner. Last year was his first year to play center. I mean, it, and credit those high school staff for helping his development over just winning games. And they continue to have a great year, by the way. Michael Turner's a really good junior running back up there. Uh, but I think Cruz is is a tremendous center prospect. Some people might nitpick arm length. Well, his arm length is the same as Creed Humphrey. I'm not saying he's going to be as good as Creed Humphrey, but Creed Humphrey's having a hell of a career with shorter arms than the average guy. Uh, so it, you don't have to be a cookie cutter at every position. Um, you know, you don't have to have that cookie cutter arm length and height and wingspan and everything. I think Daniel Cruz is a tremendous football player. I think he's a great culture fit. I think Brandon Baker has a lot of upside. I think he'll start his career at right tackle. They'll cross-train him like Cam Williams, right tackle and left tackle. Naturally, they want him to learn both. 
Uh, but Texas has uh, Trevor Goosby, a really talented young offensive tackle behind Kelvin Banks. And you got Jaden Chapman, who they're kind of trying to figure out where he's going to be. So I think Brandon Baker at right tackle, I think he's a, he's got a chance to be a big time player um, coming from modern days, played against like power five guys every day in practice, right? I think these all star games. Some guys can get uh, maybe over-evaluated in these all-star games nowadays because it, it, the game's changed, man. I mean, with NIL, guys are – you're playing not to get hurt in some of these things, I, I think, at times, or not playing, uh, which I totally get. But I think Brandon Baker's got a lot upside. Nate Kibble is interesting to me. If if there's a guy that I wouldn't underestimate, and I'm not saying he's going to be a great player, kids have to go do this and maximize their talent. They got to go get it done. He's a four-year starter at a 6A school that's a really good school. That's rare. Texas got two of those guys. Daniel Cruz as well is a four-year starter. I mean, four-year starters in 5A and 6A football in Texas on the offensive line are very few and far between. Um, and Texas signed two of those guys. And I think Kibble has that – he's got long arms for 6 two and a half. I watched him against Dickinson this season. Um, long arm guy. He's gotten more physical every single year. I think he's got upside as a guard prospect in the run game, especially. Hey guys, before we move on, I, and I just put this banner up, but Bobby, I kind of want you to touch on this. Can you tell, I mean, when you talked about Jerry, obviously it's scrolling down here uh, in the banner, but can you tell folks out there about on texasfootball.com, what to expect the new website? Yeah, absolutely. I, we started, we kind of soft launched it a couple of weeks ago. We've been posting updates every so often, et cetera. With Jerry coming aboard, we're going to continue to do that just even more. Jerry's going to be on there each and every day, as well as myself, CJ, Blake, uh, et cetera. Um, join us. Uh, it's free. Uh, we are publishing news and notes and anything and everything. Join the community. If you go there, uh, make sure you click on community. Once you get there, it should be on the top right or in the top middle, depending on whether you're on uh, mobile or desktop. Join the community. Join in. Ask us questions. Feel free to, to comment, etc. cetera. Uh, Jerry has a, a unique way on the message boards that you will soon find. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how to explain it, but Jerry is unique on the message boards. Uh, and so we'll we'll uh, have a little fun in that way. And uh, just join us. Have some fun. Uh, talk Texas football and sports, et cetera. Uh, it doesn't have to do, just be football, by the way. We do a lot, a lot of recruiting coverage, obviously. But uh, be Jerry loves basketball, baseball. Blake, you and, and CJ are nuts about it. So uh, just come and join, hang out, uh, and make it your home away from home during the day. Uh, by the way, somebody's asking about Rod Babers. Absolutely. He's, he's yeah. Working. Yeah. yeah. Okay, hey, we got to have somebody that can cover on this. On this. <laughs> <laughs> we this, talked about this is a sad group of athletes, man. I was going to say the 40 yard dash, like Rod could run the 40. Rod could run the 80 in the time I run the 40. I'll put it that way. That's my <laughs> guess. I don't want to race Rod if he's running backwards. Oh, that's, what I'll tell you. that's the embarrassment I don't need in my life. <laughs> Uh, as somebody's asking about Peyton Kirkland, long rehab with the knee. Yeah. All right. We got a super chat from Lee Barden. He says success means competing for SEC titles and college football playoff entry. No matter what, though, every year, beat the hell out of Zero U, Arky, and Aggie. What do y'all think? Jerry Hamilton, welcome back. CJ, you're rocking it. I Look, I think that that's key. I think beat your rivals, man. I, I'm all for it. It helps secure the recruiting grounds. Uh, it helps uh, make you the it school in the area, and then go have national success. That that it's a it's a really simple um, recipe for success and long term success. They need to they need to get back and beat OU this year, and then they need to go take it to A uh, and M in College Station. That that needs to happen. Yeah. All right. This next question, fellas, uh, is going to be from David Williams for Jerry. And he says, Jerry, I thought about taking it easy on your first day back, but I'm <laughs> sure you wouldn't want that. What's your take on UT recruits dropping in the recruiting rankings? I think one of the most interesting things in uh, recruiting industry now is more guys move down in rankings if they play in all-star games than play up. I, I just think that's interesting. Um I, I think in our business, we look, guys don't develop at the same time. We've talked about this for years. Guys have to maximize their talent. Guys from Florida don't have the same setup kids in Texas do, right? They're more raw. They take off in college once they get in the strength and conditioning program. Um, but I, I think, uh, you know, we, we have to watch the paralysis by analysis in our industry a little bit at times. 
Okay, and by the way, for those that are interested in the uh, realignment, I just posted them over on ontexasfootball.com. They are released. We have a thread going over there, so you can go check out where your school or your kid's school, whatever it may be, or who they're going to be playing in district here soon. So let's go to this one from Reckless Trade. Jerry, you mentioned Goosby earlier, but Trey wants to know, how is he progressing? Have any of y'all heard anything on that? 6'8", 3'10", 315. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just think about where he was when he committed. 6'6", 268, 270. I mean, in that range, 6'6 six, six and a half. I think at the Under Armour camp before his senior year, he's 6'6", six, six and maybe three quarters and 268. So just think about how far he's come physically. Um, and he's that guy. He's that guy that obviously his younger brother is a really good basketball player, maybe on the Texas radar in basketball. He got a number of offers there, 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six wing, who can really play with the ball, handle the ball, shoot it. So Trevor was a basketball guy too, right? Um, and so that was a later developing frame. Um, I think even this next year you'll see him some, but I think it's the after that where they really get his body where they want it, where you, Trevor feels comfortable with his new body, which will probably be 6'8", 325 uh, when it's all said and done, um, and continue to develop technically. Uh, I think that's a, uh, I think he's a smart kid who realizes it's a marathon and not a sprint on the offensive line. Guys who think it's a sprint on the offensive line really mess with their development cycle. It, they all develop, and Flood tells all of his guys, they all develop at their own race. I mean, you're there. Kelvin Banks was ready to go. He's running a different race than Neto yep. right now. And I think that I think we need to consider that in each and every player when we talk about them, not just the offensive line. Right. I mean, look, Anthony Hill is running a different race than Samaj Burrell. Yep. OK, but that doesn't mean Samaj Burrell can't make the best of his race. Does that, does that make sense to you? I mean, I feel like that's where a lot of kids and a lot of fans get caught up in that. Um, you know, if we that Rod Babers was talking about this yesterday on State of the Program. What 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 was Christian Jones's race? What did it look like? It didn't look very good at the at the beginning. I can tell you that much. So we need to start. I think we can do a better job as media members of communicating that. To, to 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 fans because I do believe there we're very quick to throw the baby out with the bathwater you know just oh we've already made the snap decision and it's the way it is guys guys I mean you mentioned it Jerry they develop at their own time frame and we we need to be aware of that and some of that is maturity like mental maturity and some of it is physical maturity with with Tavondre Sweat is more m mental maturity would y'all agree with that I mean yeah. He's, and, and so, but, but Byron Murphy is just more about getting more reps. And so different aspects of it. I, I'm, I'm a big believer in that. Hey, football junkie, bring up his question about Colin Simmons, because I want to address that. Uh, I, I think it needs addressing. Um, why he's dropped, I don't, why he dropped in the final rankings, I don't know. I don't necessarily agree with it. Uh, but I'll say this, he is filling out physically. Like he, he looks good physically to me uh, when I, when I spent some time with him at the Under Armour game there, I, I've said he's going to have a frame like Robert Mathis, the old Colts linebacker edge guy, but with a little bit longer arms. I think he is going to be a rocked up six, two and a quarter. He's a little taller than Mathis, 250 pound guy, but he looks good physically. He's developing the right way. Um, I don't know. They didn't height and weight guys down there at the Under Armour game. They only do that if they have the, the when they used to have the junior future 50 event, which I was part of. That's now in the summer. So they don't height and weight guys down there. But if I was putting the eye test to it, six, two and a quarter, 225, maybe. I think he lost about 10 pounds during the season. And I think that's going to be his battle as he continues uh, to mature. Uh, and they mature that frame out. Is is he going to be two forty five, then be two thirty five by the end of the next season? We'll see. I think Tory Beckton's really good at what he does, but I think he'll play in the two forty range next year. Is my bet. And Jerry, you know who else looked good down there in Orlando was Zeno Umi Ozulu as well. Yeah. yeah, he probably had the biggest oh you know reaction for me whenever he walked through the door. So the two edge guys Texas brought in this last class both filling out nicely. And, and I can tell you guys too. Um, is, uh, Phil Simi really fills out a uniform at the safety position. People are going to be kind of like surprised when they see him. The other thing from the Under Armour game, which since we're into that, 
I can tell you guys this. Kobe Black looked like a South Florida guy to me. And he's a smaller school guy that plays multiple sports. He has, he has, I don't even think he scratched the surface physically. I think he could weigh 215 pounds one day. I really do. I mean, if he's if he's legitimate 195 at that time, 197 down in Orlando, man, he hasn't even started yet physically. He's a guy that's going to look uh, – when you look back on his senior year high school photos after one year in college, he's going to look dramatically different for a DB. And you don't say that about many skill guys. All right, so we're going to take a question from the ontexasfootball.com forums. And this is from Texas fan in Georgia. He says, what should Sark's game plan be for the red zone issues? Last season, it felt like he got cute at times. And other times, it felt like he tried to impose his will and just failed. With the improved line of scrimmage in the SEC, what do y'all think will work? You know, we talked about this. I really think it's it's Quinn Ewers uh, and Sark having some or more confidence in Quinn to let him do what he needs to do in the red zone. I mean, Texas only really ran RPO game in the red zone. They did, And I, I think that may have been what come back, came back to bite them at the last seconds there in Washington. They looked like they didn't know what to do because there was no RPO that was going to work. They weren't going to run from the 15, right? And that inexperience may maybe bit them a little bit but I think that overall, they Quinn Quinn needs to fire up the fastball a little bit, and Sark needs to call it a little bit. I think yep. Sark is anti turnover in the red zone, big time. That's very very clear, and he doesn't he doesn't want to turn the ball over down there. But I think they're going to have to figure that out. I think they're going to have to figure out a better red zone offense and play calls that'll get them there. That's my hey, Blake. Speaking of firing up the fastball, bring up Roger G's question on LSU real quick. What is LSU selling and recruiting off a nine and three season where to where they've beaten Texas, who is off a college football playoff appearance and multiple early recruitments? Yeah, so I think it's a I think it's multiple things here, tentacles on this one. Um don't underestimate Frank Wilson, Corey Raymond, and Bo Davis together at LSU. I'm just yeah. gonna tell you that now. Those guys are very tight. They've known each other for years. Like you look at Jabori Antoine, what flipped on that? Well, one of his very best friends is the head coach at New Iberia. Westgate High, one of his very best friends. Um, Who's his best friends? Uh, look, Corey Raymond. Okay. Uh, so, look, I mean, bringing Raymond back, uh, bring getting Bo in there with Frank Wilson and Corey Raymond. I mean, that's a uh, – and then you have Nick Saban retired at Alabama, right? I mean, so there's a lot of factors into that. Um, but those three guys together at LSU, that's a pretty potent – Who are the head, head-to-head wins? Jabori Antone and, and DeCorian Moore, and that's it, right, right now? Uh, uh, Harlem Barry running back again. That's a right. That's Frank, Wilson, that's Frank Wilson. In New yeah, that's Frank Wilson in New Orleans, man. I mean, that's a yeah. that's a though, though. Here's here's your battles moving forward. Look, is watch Jakeem Stewart in 26, the D tackle, the five start St. Augustine. If LSU can get him in the boat early, that's a pretty good sign that things have changed in that state because that's a recruitment that should go a while because he is an elite a defensive line prospect, and those guys are real, true recruiting battles for months, if not years. But if LSU can get him in the boat a little earlier than expected, that's when people are going to take a little notice in Louisiana. And Brandon Harris was out to see Lamar Brown as well, who's also a top 10 prospect in the 26 class there when he was on the trail about a week ago. So a lot going on, and I saw the comment, LSU's putting the fence around the Louisiana again. I with the staff like that, it's going to be very difficult for Texas to walk in and poach what they had had success in the last couple of cycles. And, and, and let's let's think about this too. Nick Saban had more success at Alabama and Louisiana than any other coach on I twenty especially. Um, I twenty is still even though LSU just got Devin Harper from Captain Shreve, the four star offensive lineman. I twenty is still an area. You, you can get into in Louisiana and have success. I think there's a lot of talented players. LSU can't take them all. They want to recruit around the region. I-10, New Orleans, that area with Corey Raymond, with Frank, that's a little different game now. Those are going to be some different battles. Yeah. I, I, I-20 I obviously being Shreveport over to Monroe, all the way into Vicksburg, Mississippi. Uh, the one thing I, I would uh, add to that, uh, Jaden Daniels won the Heisman yeah. this year. That that allows for some momentum, especially among uh, what I would call skill offensive skill players. 
right? And so I think that pl- has played a role, even though they were nine and three and didn't really do well, uh, do great. I, I I think that that had a that played a role. That kind of elevates your program, just like it did with Texas and Ricky Williams. To no some I mean, Texas didn't have a great team that year. They had a really good team, uh, but that that plays a role. And let's say the flip side. I think. Brian Kelly's got as much pressure on him this year at LSU as maybe any year in his coaching career. Was with Nick gone at Bama, every fan base thinks, now it's our time, baby. We're going to go dominate. Oh, except Texas and Oklahoma are moving into the SEC. Oh, and AM hired a new coach who's going to get good defensive players, by the way. They're going to evaluate well on that side of the ball and with better fits or character, whatever you want to call it. So I think there's more pressure on Brian Kelly than ever before this year. Because the perception is, oh, now you should go just win it this year because Nick Saban retired. It's not that easy, but they're going to have a lot of good players. All right, we've got a big super chat here that I want to bring up from Josh. Thank you, Josh. He says, thank you for getting Jerry back on. Josh, thank you. Appreciate it. I just bought Blake another autographed baseball. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, I got like six more in that I got to put up. I just haven't done it yet, so... Same, same. <laughs> like, like, are you? What got you into the autograph deal, the, the hobby? Just your love for sports, or what? Yeah, I, I mean, pretty much. I, that's honestly it. And then you know, my my son, obviously a big baseball nut, the player. Um, and so you know, that was kind of like an extra step of that. And then, but honestly, my middle son is the one that's like, I mean, he he blows me and the oldest out of the water <laughs> by far. So. A lot, a lot of these back here are more him <laughs> than I am. Got it. It's, it's fun. It's fun for sure. We, we've yeah. had a couple of questions. There's no Manscaped read this week, but I do have it. So we're, we're, we're ready to roll when it comes back. Jerry, hey, you're like proud of it. You, Jerry. Man. <laughs> I don't CJ, know. this is what you get, dude. This is what you get hanging out with these guys. I love it. No. <laughs> All right, Bobby, before we move on, why don't you tell everybody out there about Rick Bobro and Austin Underground? Yeah, absolutely. Our friend Rick Vavro has been helping us out here on On Texas Football for several months now. We re- really appreciate him. Since 2004, Austin Underground has specialized in difficult underground commercial installations. The team's engineering background gives Austin Underground the ability to perform work other firms often consider too risky. Rick and his team offer an end to end client experience, including seamless communication, budgeting, staffing, and top notch trade partners. And most importantly, they produce solid quality work each and every time. That's Rick Vavro and his team at Austin Underground. Thanks again, Rick, for your sponsorship of On Texas Football. We have had a couple of questions about DeCorey Moore. He's a recruit through the whistle guy. I mean, look, Texas will stay on him. They're not going to walk away from a five-star receiver in the state of Texas as talented as DeCorey and Moore. Uh, can they flip him? I don't know. We'll, we'll see over time. But Texas will stay in there. Harlem Berry – little bit different game there. I mean, that when I was at the, his high school last year, it was pretty easy to tell how much he really liked LSU growing up. I mean, that was a uh, – he was really sold on that LSU offense. Um, and even now they have a coordinator change. But uh, I think that would be a much tougher one. But we'll see. Well, Jerry, you mentioned Nick Saban's name a few times a few minutes ago. And Jose Rodriguez says, Jerry, it's good to have you back. Since you've been away from the UT beat and on the national beat for a minute, what team, in your opinion, has made the biggest push after Saban retired so as far as money, recruiting, et cetera, and yeah. the Oregon? Yeah, well, I think Oregon's obviously outside of the Southeast region. But but I'm here to tell you now, and I think what's going to be an interesting battle is Auburn. People hardly had to have had an idea. Auburn has four D linemen and 25 committed that are really, really freaking good now. Um those are in 25? I think, in 25 class. They got four dudes committed. Three of them all – Antonio Coleman flipped from Bama to Auburn. Um, now, will he stay committed? There's a long way to go before these guys sign, but Auburn was making some hay on the defensive line where they had to um, because they had fallen way – they were at a really good D-line group for about six, seven, eight years in a row, multiple NFL draft picks. They kind of fell off. They, the guys they have committed in 25 are – are really, really good. So I think inside that state, you know, one of the things Nick Saban said, and we talked about on the show, guys, once you get past 70 and you're out there on the recruiting trail, every single person, parent, kid, asks you how long you're going to be there. Parent asked, are you going to coach my son the whole way through? 
it gets harder to answer those questions. Um, so I think people were taken really going at Nick a little bit on that. Uh, obviously, NIL is part of the game. Uh, but I think Oregon outside the SEC region. But I think Auburn in the state had done, it was off to a great start in 25. And we'll see if they can continue that momentum. What do you think of Miami? Because I, I, I would have said Oregon my, and Miami kind of upped their game this year a little bit. Yeah, uh, you know, Miami's that, – that's a tougher one for me. I mean, I'm, I'm going to take a knee on that one, which Mario should have done. Um, <laughs> I don't know if they've been – like, they're not on Oregon's level to me. I think they're trying, uh, obviously. I think Miami – I think where some of these schools are really it, – it, it's interesting because what's going to happen with Billy Napier at Florida. So Nick retiring and the questions about Billy Napier. Ooh, they went and carpet bomb at bomb Texas and offers yesterday, this week, by the way, at Florida. Um, I think though that combination of that helped both Florida State and Miami, but Florida's able to hold on to LJ McCray at the end of the day, who is a big time defensive line prospect. Okay, guys, we have a super chat from Arch Mania, and he says, How much boost will the pro see when Arch takes the reins? Get ready for the media mania. Yeah, that, that name's pretty fitting for that question, I would say. I mean, uh, it, it's certainly going to help having that Manning name kind of circulating the airwaves wearing a Texas jersey. It helped in recruiting. It's helping in the 25 cycle. It helped in the 24 cycle. You can talk about his presence as a Texas Longhorn already is paying dividends without him really playing a meaningful snap already. When you start seeing him kind of carry that torch from Quinn Ewers, who we expect to be pretty early drafty uh, this upcoming draft, we expect – now to see Arch Manning follow suit as well and seeing him, as you said, kind of carry that media torch in the sense that ESPN is going to have every highlight, Bleach Report, House of Highlights, Twitter will be covering just about everything that he does. It's just free publicity for Texas and the opportunity to say, hey, come play for Texas because now, you know, one, look at the evaluation that he'll have on the field as a result of all these extra clicks, but also, you know, it it's free advertising for Steve Sarkeesian to say, hey, I've got two, you know, number one draft pick quarterbacks basically to come out and say, we're always going to be competitive regardless of who's here. And, uh, I mean, Bobby, I see you shaking your head. I, I Look, his recruiting at quarterback is ridiculous. I mean, if you're down, your quarterback's going to be Trey Owens, freaking sign me up. I mean, that's 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 ridiculous. Um, you know, I look, we can talk about this until we're blue in the face, but Texas had some good, talented teams in, in the 2010s. And until Sam Ellinger really got going, it was too late by that time. He didn't have enough compatriots to help him, really. Um, but what, what would Texas have been with a Quinn Ewers and an Arch Manning in the early 2010s? Art, it, Mac Brown would still be the head coach. That's what would have happened. That's how important guys like Arch Manning are. And, you know, I, I'm uh, Steve Sarkeesian and AJ, AJ Milwee and whoever helped recruit him. OK, they've done that's just Arch Manning is the pinnacle of that, in my opinion, because of the name, the Manning name on, on the back end of it. But there's more in the pipeline at quarterback for Texas. Somebody's next, asking Miguel Gonzalez about the lineman. I was actually that was going to be the next yeah. one I brought up. <laughs> but keeping Brandon Brown is number one for me. Uh, I, it was really good to see Sark and Jeff Banks stop by there at O'Galley in Melbourne this week. Um, I went out, I've seen Brandon, uh, went over the school. I'll be back. Um, I just think he's an elite, elite prospect, man. I mean, just so much natural, natural strength, hand strength, just an explosive quickness, man. I mean, he is a big time defensive line guy. And I think he's a really good fit in the sec as a disruptor He's a guy who can play on the other team's line of scrimmage. I think Zion Williams, uh, Lufkin, uh, obviously, uh, Texas was by there yesterday. New beat line coach was by there yesterday. Um, and, uh, Dylan Battle up at Mansfield Timberview. Texas is going to see today. Is very talented, um, and they're gonna. They've offered a couple other guys. Myron Charles now out in Florida in Port Charlotte. Uh, but I think keeping Brandon Brown is key. Zion Williams at Lufkin is going to be one of those real interesting recruiting battles. It's not going to be as much fun as Jamarcus McFarland's recruitment for Bobby and everybody that remember that one. But Zion <laughs> Williams is such an interesting battle because he is in Lufkin in East Texas. And you have Mike Elko at AM, new staff, right? Texas, new D-line coach, right? Bo Davis at LSU. I think he's going to go to one of those three schools at the end of the day. 
Um, he went that he, he he didn't go to Texas Junior Day. He went to LSU uh, after Bo was hired there. Obviously, Texas was by yesterday. A and M's all over him. He's going to be one of the more fun recruitments because he's 6'4", 310, wears an 18 shoe and can anchor the middle of your defense in the SEC, and that makes him very valuable. There's going to be guys ranked ahead of him, but he's very valuable. Um, you also have uh, the guys down in Houston that Baker started off seeing, Landon Rink, yep. uh, Floyd Guidry. You mentioned Chase Sims. Uh, then you also have guys like Xavier Puno, I think, yep. that they're going to see either today or tomorrow. Today. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, they there are a lot of defensive linemen out there. I think it's actually a good year in state for defensive line, for, for uh, particularly at defensive tackle. Even. Well, and, and, let's, and this will – Bobby, this will really excite Bobby. Uh, Floyd Guidry was a 40 the, – the junior spring, which I'm very high on. If he's not a four-star prospect, we all ought to reevaluate this stuff. Um, he's 6'2", 275. 47'10", 47'11", shot put as a glider last year, Bobby, as a sophomore, as a glider, okay? <laughs> Chase, Chase Sims at Richmond Randall was at Lamar Consolidated as a sophomore at Richmond Randall now. I talked with him. Uh, recently, 6'3", 285. He presses 44 as a sophomore. So, I mean, you're talking about two guys who are going to be 50-foot shot putters as junior. Once you hit that 50 number, that takes you to a different level of explosiveness. I'll say this about Landon Rink. Uh, a lot of people know my son's a, a senior over at Sci Fair, but um, so I've, I go over there quite a bit. But Landon has put on really good weight. He's 6'2", and a change, 278, but it's a really well-proportioned 278. He's going to get the 290, 295. He's not going to be a 315-pound guy, but he's retained his quickness and his athleticism as his dad's done a great job, Shane Rink, the former Texas defensive lineman, D-line coach at Cy Fair, of adding weight over time. But, he, you know, you put that guy at 290, 295 with the motor he has, and it's not surprising that Ryan Day, uh, Steve Sarkeesian, Brent Venables, all these guys have been the Cy Fair in the last two weeks. He's a really good player because of that motor more than his frame. Well, Ray Potter wants to know how many – wrong one. Uh, how many D linemen do you think Texas will take? Three, four. Three or four. That's exactly where I was at. That, that's the number. You start at three on the defensive tackle, and then you go to four if you need it. And I, so I think it's going to depend what some of these guys turn out at. But I think minimum three this year. And then we'll jump over to the other side of the ball, guys. Champ Bailey says, the Texas on commit watch for Ricky Stewart. I think CJ's got that one. Yeah. Yeah. He opened up his uh, commitment from SMU yesterday. Uh, something to keep an eye on here is Baylor. Baylor hired the SMU running back coach in uh, the middle of December. His teammate, Demetrius Brisbane, over at Chapel Hill, just committed to Baylor as well last night. So something to watch. Texas felt really – Really good. You know, they, they obviously made a big impact on Ricky Stewart following his, his uh, offer on the junior day. He got kind of, he got choked up. You know, he was talking about how, how much it meant to him. He said, quote, basically, uh, I had never felt an emotion like this whenever the offer came. So the Texas offer meant a lot to him at the time. There are a lot of a lot of ties right now to Baylor right now. And I think there's uh, some momentum to watch from the Bears in that recruitment at the moment. And then Jay Dobbs says, regarding five-star recruits, would you guys rather have a five-star running back or a five-star offensive lineman like a left tackle? Give me the In tackle. the SEC, give me the left tackle. <laughs> All day long. Easily. There's a reason there are premium positions. I mean, that you this is the the SEC is the proving ground for the NFL, if you look at it that way. Um, and so I think that those guys matter more in a They'll matter more in more games. I'll put it that way. Okay, and then we will finish it up with this question right here from uh, Daniel Villafranco. And he says, what kind of stats would Nye Black and Blue need to have to get drafted after this season? I, You know, Nye Black for me, I'm not sure it's about stats as much as um, it, it just big plays with him and, you know, showing – willingness to be a blocker I think is going to be big for him right he's probably going to be asked to do a lot of similar things to Tavion Sanders was and that could be pass pro one-on-one -on -one with an SEC edge well he did practice against that at Alabama against some guys that are going to be first round picks 
But if he goes out and proves that, I think he's going to make plays in the passing game. I, I'd be shocked. I, he, I don't think he's going to have as many catches as JT Sanders. Guys, I'm not sure he might not have more yards, though. I think he's going to have a huge season. Well, this is, this is true because C.J. Jerry, when you were gone, was telling us about the average yards, yards thrown to by Nye Black was astronomically different than J.T. Sanders. What was it, 17 yards? Give, give people that stat, C.J., just to give them a feel. And, Jerry, I think this will be interesting to you as well. Yeah. Amari Nyblock, of any Power 5 tight end last year, had the most yards per – the average distance of target was longer down the field than anybody in the country by five yards. He was averaging 16.5 yards per target down the field, not including anything after the catch or anything. This is pure air – air distance travel of the football for him uh, receiving the ball. 16 and a half yards. Next closest was 11.3. What was JT Sanders like 10 and a half or something like that? Uh, low tens. So <laughs> quite a difference. Yeah. yeah I, I think you'll see less of tight end and screen game with Nye Black and more of, all right, D coordinator, here comes Bond and Nye Black running down the field that you, what are you going to do with it? <laughs> Uh, well, I said that was the last question. We're going to do one more because we, we started with the Jerry question. We're going to end with the Jerry question. Champ Bailey 3 says, Jerry, how do you feel about Racine Gilroy from Alito, and how important is it for Texas to maintain his commitment? What I like about Racine Gilroy, I think he's a, you know, he's a good match for what Texas is uh, kind of different than what they've recruited in the last class, right? And, and I'm interested to see if he stays 2026. We'll assume he will, right? Uh, but you never know with kids nowadays. Uh, but I think his ability to play in space, I think, is really big. Uh, Sark covets those guys. He wants to have his downhill guys to run inside zone with those guys. Uh, but that you you have to have the space players at running back too, and especially to maximize everything Sark wants to do in his offense. And I think he's a. I think that guy's got a chance to be a real weapon. And I'm not saying he can't run between the tackles, but I, what I am saying is in the SEC, if you can get him in space, that makes you harder to defend. I love it because this is going to be one of the things we can talk about later, but I want to get Jerry's take eventually on how Sark is adding so much speed yes. to the roster right now on offense and in the secondary. I mean, on offense in particular. It should be should be huge. Jerry, thanks for rejoining us, buddy. Uh, we appreciate you so much. And I'm trying to say this. Uh, Blake and I and CJ have talked about it as well as Rod and everybody. Uh, I really appreciate you, you rejoining the team, dude. Welcome back. Uh, so glad to have you here, man. And uh, let's keep it going and uh, continue to have more fun, man. Yeah, uh, well, uh, on TexasFootball.com, uh, come on over and we'll we'll chat it up today and every day. I'm tight. Well, Bobby, tell them what they can expect later today right here on the YouTube channel. Well, Monday. I think Jerry and CJ are going to do their first little com tete tete today a little bit. They're going to talk a little uh, recruiting, I believe, uh, this afternoon. And then uh, Bob Shipley and Rod Babers will come back tonight. Uh, with their weekly football theory uh, discussion as well. And then back tomorrow morning, Jerry Hampton, myself, Blake Monroe, I think CJ's going to step in for a little bit uh, as well. We'll have it all here for you guys on texasfootball.com. Uh, guys, thank you all so much for sticking with us, and we'll see you tomorrow, hopefully, and later today. That's right. So, and also got to say thank you for tuning in. Thank you to Rick Volvro and Austin Underground for sponsoring today's show. Uh, thank you for all the super chats, man. There was just so many comments, questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but hey, head on over to ontexasfootball.com, ask them there, and uh, we'll, we'll get them answered. So for Bobby, Jerry, and CJ, I'm Blake Monroe, and we'll see you tomorrow morning.